Thanks for having me, Cyber. Yeah, so, Kevin, you are the author of, and before anybody goes crazy, uh, just remember, we're going to have a totally fair interview. The book title is Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know. So this is the new second book that you've written on the topic. You're a former um, drug control official in the Obama administration. More, you've been involved here in, in, in really drug advocacy work now for almost 25 years. And so it's interesting and it'll be fun to talk to you, especially today, which it is coming out on 420. Marshall, yeah. what do we want to talk to Kevin about today? Just want to be clear about something from the start. We read the book, and Kevin, what I actually appreciated so much during the book is you're able to balance two different hats that one has to be able to do if you're going to have this conversation the right way. You're explaining the way things work, aka, as of last November, there are a variety of states that have now decriminalized drugs. So what does that look like? What are the implications? What are the challenges you're going to face? That's your analyst reporting side. And then there's a side of you who's also an advocate for policy. So we're going to balance those two bits here. So as you're thinking about this, even if you don't agree with Kevin's broader take on drug policy and in specific to marijuana, just the framework of thinking about, hey, you live in Oregon, where I'm from, mm -hmm. the status quo has really changed very suddenly. How are you going to confront the challenges? It's just really important. So Kevin would um, love to really start there with a very basic question. What got you into this line of work? Because in the biography, this isn't just, hey, I found myself in D.C. and they needed to hire someone <laughs> to work on drug policy. And, you know, the State Department wasn't open, so I chose this. This was you have been interested in this stuff since middle and high school. Yeah, You're either Thanks, a narc or you uh, are a person <laughs> who honestly has like a relationship of always like, what, how is this working? <laughs> Maybe I'm a little bit of both, right? There's conspiracy <laughs> theories abound. Uh, no, you know, I fell into this by accident, uh, but I, it wasn't by accident when I was 30 or 25 or 20. It was by accident when I was 13 or 14. Never ever even seen alcohol in my house. My parents didn't drink. Uh, they still don't, uh, nor do I. Uh, so alcohol wasn't prevalent. Drugs weren't prevalent. But Really, as I became a teenager involved in sports and all the kind of normal things, quote unquote, normal things that teenage kids, especially if you're growing up in Southern California, are involved in, um, I, you know, more and more of my friends were, were smoking pot and drinking and a couple of them were having a really hard time with it. And I just got became something in me was very fascinated with that question. You know, what is the addiction? What seems to sort of take over the brain in a certain way? And I was always very fascinated by the brain and these questions. And I also really liked to write. Um, I thought I wanted to be a journalist. And so um, I kind of all of these worlds collided basically when there was a there was a high school newspaper that was published by actually it was printed by the Orange County Register and it went out to every high school kid in the county. And I got to kind of marry my love for writing with this issue that I have had discovered by happenstance by some friends. And I started doing that. Then I started noticing some really wacky policies and things that were going on, like uh, my school board in Orange County, that was a libertarian school board that did not want to take a dime in federal free federal money for after school programs. And that kind of bothered me. I had not grown up in an ideological family at all. So it just I didn't understand why anybody would say, you know, there's some proven after school counseling programs that help kids. And then I realized I peeled back the onion and I realized that people did not want to admit that drugs were an issue here in Orange County. They wanted to think that it was only in the quote unquote bad neighborhoods. And I knew that drugs were very prevalent. So all of these things kind of happened to me as I was sort of in my formative years. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating, Kevin. And listening to you, it's clear you're passionate about the issue. You've been literally been working on it for almost yeah. your entire professional life. I'll ask a provocative question, which is one that people have uh, hit at me before. In a way, the war on drugs has been a complete failure from a public perspective. I'm not even talking about policy, mm -hmm. as in we see mass discriminalization, mass yeah. legalization. I think I looked at a poll today that a super majority of Americans support the legalization, not decriminalization, the legalization mm -hmm. of marijuana. So in a way, those after school programs funding mm -hmm. you were talking about there, D.A.R.E. and more, I mean, they did fail in terms of convincing public opinion. What went wrong from your perspective or am I just completely misguided? 
Well, it's interesting. So I think there are people have more nuance. So I, I would challenge a little bit the premise of the question in that I think that when people are given, you know, a yes or no kind of d dichotomy for whether they agree with the policy, you're right, you're going to get 60%, 65% saying, yeah, you know, let's legalize marijuana. Um, but when they are given choices, so Emerson has done this, a couple of other pollsters, some good pollsters have done this, where they have given people, you know, four choices for marijuana policy, right? Legalization, meaning sales, decriminalization, meaning low-level possession is legal, sales is illegal, prohibition, or medical only, where it's prohibited except for specific medical purposes, you basically almost get an even split of answers. And I, so I think that it's more nuanced. But I think what happened, but you're right in that if you ask people about the war on drugs or sort of you know, has drug policy worked? Um, you can ask that question in 20 different ways. You're going to get the same majority answer being no, probably by mm -hmm. big margins. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, we all know people who use drugs. So we think like, well, this didn't prevent that person or, you know, look at the opioid epidemic. Obviously we have, you know, whether we should legalize is another story, but this has been a failure, right? So regardless of what you think should happen afterwards. Um, and I think that what also happened is that we've had a very well-funded movement that really, it's very interesting. I'm not into sim simplifying things too much, but it does kind of go back to a very simple three people, three men, three billionaires funded the, I'll call it normalization of marijuana starting in the early 1990s. And if you think about history, you know, in the 1970s, there was a surge of marijuana use. There was the counterculture, it was the hippie era. Um, you even had President Carter, who ironically is the first quote praising my book, but when he was president, he said uh, that he, you know, essentially believed in the decriminalization of marijuana. His drug czar believed in the legalization of cocaine and marijuana. In fact, even used cocaine at a famous party put on by marijuana advocates, which actually led to his uh, firing. But, um, but the point is, we had a, we had a, we had a situation in the in society that was very accepting of drugs in the 1970s, and then this changed in the 1980s, probably because of crack cocaine as a new form of cocaine that was very scary to a lot of Americans. It was you got high a lot faster because it came in, you know, through smoking rather than through, through, uh, you know, nasal, which is regular cocaine. And so, so you had this resurgence of an anti-drug movement um, that was spurred on by a lot of things. And then in the, and then, so the, the legalizers pause, were in disarray. Kevin? Yeah, sure. Because Too long. this is going to just ha consistently happen. Oh, no, no, no. This no. is going to consistently just happen in the conversation sure. because drugs are clearly usually metaphors for other things in our society, is it easy to say that what happens in the 1980s is the issue racializes? So we're saying crack cocaine yeah. becomes an issue. This is no longer hippy dippy liberals from the 60s. This is like a crime yeah. spike in Baltimore, yeah. Reagan's president, welfare queen language. Like yeah. How do you think that plays it? Because well, once again, this is the language which yeah, advocates you know, use to say that these policies are racist. Anytime yeah, look, I think that. I think that there was a racial element to it. And there was another part of the racial element too. It wasn't just crack cocaine was associated with, you know, super predators and black kids. And that was scary. And that, that, that is true. I mean, I'm not here to whitewash this stuff. That, that, that is mm -hmm. part of the story. Okay. But also part of the story, which you could say is just as racist was suburban moms found out that their kids were smoking pot in the late seventies. And that really, they did not like that. These are, these are now a lot of these moms used themselves 15 years ago, but now they're parents and they didn't want their kids using. And so, so they also didn't like that. And they had political power. They literally convinced Nancy Reagan to take this on as an issue. Nancy Reagan had no reason to take on just to say no to drugs. She did not have a drug problem. Drugs were not an issue for the Reagans. I mean, they had seen it in Hollywood. But really, as part of that generation, you were totally not exposed, even in Hollywood, to this issue. And so the reason she adopted this, I think, part of it was the parents, mainly white suburban moms, who really said, whoa, this is becoming a big issue. And crack cocaine and the death of the biggest basketball star in the mid-1980s before he died, Len Bias, in college, you know, that happened. All of these big things happened, which, which absolutely kind of fueled this. And then it was, you know, Bill Clinton, um, you know, competing with Republicans about who's going to be tougher on this. And um, all of that happened. And then in the, the legalizers were in disarray, and then they came up with the most brilliant PR of any public policy I know of, and that PR was the term medical marijuana. How mm -hmm. can you know? How do you turn something that people don't like into something that they are not only okay with, that they like, that they want, because it's going to help their 
mom with cancer or them, their friend with AIDS related, you know, wasting syndrome or whatever. And that was a brilliant um, turn of phrase that they used. And they, these three billionaires, Peter Lewis, John Sperling, George Soros, were able to kind of ride that. And now we are kind of bearing the fruits of their work is happening now. So let's talk about that. From medical marijuana to decriminalization to full-blown legalization, which is what we have right now. Uh, Question number one, what is wrong with the term medical marijuana? So somebody comes forward and says, look, like people who have glaucoma or like in this one instance, like this kid has seizures and it helps him not use seizures. And also, Kevin, your schedule one status prevents medical research into yeah. all of this. So let's start off yeah. just with those because these are some of the most common arguments you're going to hear about this sure. and then we'll progress forward. So I'll start off with the last comment first because yeah. that's the easiest to debunk, which is that's just flat out false. Scheduling does not mean that you can't research this. There are tens of thousands of research papers on all kinds of schedule one drugs. If you couldn't research schedule one drugs, folks, we wouldn't know what heroin did to you. We wouldn't know what LSD did to you. We know about what those do to you because that's a schedule one drug. Now, does it make it hard? Harder, a little bit. Should I think? Do I think it shouldn't be made easier? Absolutely. And I'm proud that I, you know, we've helped champion legislation to make dr- researching marijuana easy. But the idea that it's scheduled because we don't know about it, but then we don't know about it because it's scheduled, is is wrong. That's a clever argument, but it's wrong. Uh, number mm-hmm. two, which is more complicated. Look, I'm not here to poo-poo people's positive experience with medical marijuana. People probably know someone who's used it and it's helped with pain or whatnot. What I'm here to say is from a policy perspective, we've done it all wrong. Um, we don't have medical you know, heroin or, or medical, we do have medical cocaine. Cocaine is a medic is a schedule two drug because it has medical purposes, but we don't have a cocaine dispensary on Venice beach with a, you know, girl in a bikini selling you, you know, a, a couple grams, right? That's what not the medical properties of cocaine. I didn't know that. Well, there are, so there's certain parts like of numbing, cocaine. Right? That, yeah. Numbing for certain yeah. kinds of surgeries and in diff, different kind of nasal dental procedures, et cetera, can be used and surgical procedures. So, but it's, that's administered through the FDA through very tight regulations. I'm all for marijuana being administered that way. Um, but instead, Mar- the advocate said, you know what? We're not going to wait for the FDA. We, we, we you know, screw the scientific method. We're going to take it straight to the voters. And even though this represents 1% of all users, we're going to put a per- person up there on TV with cancer saying that it helps them. And that'll work. And, and you know what? It did. It, that did work. It, it's a brilliant it play. Brilliant. Again, there, marijuana is a very complex plant. There are hundreds of components in it, hundreds of ingredients. There are medical properties to some of those ingredients. I'm not here to argue with anybody about that, but I just think we should at the very least have some kind of scientific method. And look, you know, think about the vaccine that we have now, the, co- the different vaccines. Can you imagine if we just put it up to the voters about whether the vaccine, which vaccine, mm. you know, should be approved? Um, now, remember, with the vaccine, we had that approved very quickly through a special FDA authorization through, to rush certain certain drugs. There are ways, and I've argued for this, if you're end of stage, end of, you know, life kind of thing, I really don't care if you use meth, let alone marijuana, right. all right? So yes. we could have programs, but the combination of some government inertia, and I will blame the government where there's I'm not here to defend the man all the time that I will blame the government inertia among by the way both all admitted Republicans and Democrats because for a lot of reasons they don't want to touch this issue or if they do it's in a very extreme way um, so I'll blame some of that but then I'll also put the blame to advocates many of whom have said that legalization of all drugs by the way is the end game not just marijuana so I think that was a very disingenuous argument but it worked Kevin, Mm. you are making this difficult because you just said two really interesting things in a one minute period and want to be reasonable and not throw too many questions at you. So in quick succession, number one, you just said Democrats and Republicans don't want to touch this issue. But earlier, you specifically Mm. said that suburban moms Mm -hmm. freaked out about marijuana. So from our political consensus here, any issue, they get suburban moms hopped up seems to be the definition of something that politicians should want to touch. So why okay, isn't so that so? Let me dissect it. Yeah, I, so I was being simplistic. So let's go into some detail. What I mean by Democrats and Republicans have not wanted to touch it, I don't mean the issue in general. What I mean is the, do the hard work of figuring out the nuances 
of, for example, medical research or who should get special authorization to use marijuana medically, what specific program, what can the feds do to make this make more sense? That hasn't been, that's a bureaucratic, really a lot of it's bureaucrats, but they take the lead from obviously politicians. That just has not been done. I mean, Obama, Bush didn't, Clinton didn't do it, Bush didn't do it, Obama didn't do it, Trump didn't do it. It's just, it, I'll just also say as an aside, if you want to talk about this later, this is not an issue that is on the radar of most people, let alone most politicians. I mean, yes, it's on the radar of Matt, if you're Matt Gates, Dana Rohrabacher, Steve Cohen. I mean, I can name Republican. Oh, yeah. um, you know, uh, so there's Republican. Ba- yeah. Well, yeah, now Boehner, but it wasn't before. <laughs> and that actually makes my point is that when he was mainstream, it wasn't um, because this is not an, an issue that brings voters out, actually. And that's going to sound controversial to some people. Oh, my God, Obama won Colorado because they voted to legalize it there. No, that's not why he won Colorado. That, it so, didn't, wait, that, wait, that wait, wasn't let me I, yeah. I hear this from the progressives all the time. I know. Is that, you know, he is, Michael Moore said that if you put yeah. legalization no. of marijuana on bar with Biden, then he would win. And Biden is a dumbass because he's not doing that. And the Democrats are sold out. So your response. Biden is president of the United States. And other than Mike Bloomberg, he was the only one to oppose legalization. <laughs> so, so not only was he not silent, Zagar, he yeah. opposed it and he won. Yeah, that's, that's the a good best point. example of that. This is not abortion. This is not mm. the climate change. This is not the economy. This is not even about the troops. This is this is an issue that ranks unless you're an advocate number 77 on your list of things that you look at when you look at a candidate. So I think, but that also has perpetuated some inertia among, I'm saying more mainstream politicians to sort of take this on. And one quick thing for my second one that I'll throw to you, Sagar. We're going through this history. You said something interesting. You made the point that the strategy was medical marijuana. Um, for those listeners who yeah. don't come from bow initiative states or who are international, it'd be great if you were to explain a lot of the way that strategy proceeded. But here's just a question here. I'm from Oregon, so we have ballot initiatives. California yeah. has ballot initiatives where you're from. I couldn't just put on the ballot medical meth and we're all good to go. Why? And you get into this, okay. get into this during your book. The federal government effectively put up with medical marijuana in a way yes. they would not have put up with medical crack cocaine or just yeah. throwing medical in front of other drugs. So how did that go down? I love talking about history. So we're going to that's awesome. So so let me let me answer this. So first of all, if you had a million dollars um, I, and I have thought and this is I've never revealed this in public. I have thought it would be really provocative and really fun to put on the ballot medical meth because to show people that you could do that because you actually could. If you need, if you had a million bucks, Marshall, you could. But let me tell you, in terms of with a blowback you'd receive, like what you're asking for, um, if for the C-SPAN, uh, you know, nuts out there, of which I'm I'm one of them, you should Google uh, in C-SPAN the ni- December 31st, 1996 press conference with Barry McCaffrey, Donna Shalala, remember her, former representative now, wow. HHS secretary under Clinton, and Janet, the late Janet Reno, who spoke at my commencement in Berkeley. I thought she was great. Okay, go to the three. And they have a press conference where the drugs are, and you know he's a good friend of mine, Barry, and he's a wonderful guy. You know, at the time, youngest living four-star general. He's Clinton's drug czar. He's getting up on stage saying, "If a doctor comes close to this, you will be sued by the federal government." They had an hour-long press conference about the evil. Donna Shalala says marijuana use is not only unhealthy. Donna Shalala says it is wrong. I mean, wow. it's she makes a moral argument, okay, which like yeah. that's just we wouldn't have heard that from Alex <laughs> Azar, let alone Donna right. Shalala, okay, in 1996. And so the government did try actually and do a bit of a crackdown. And actually, Clinton, Bush, and in Obama, they did raids on some medical marijuana st- stores and things like that. The point is, it grew so fast. The feds did not have a real coordinated strategy that in terms of that they could really take control of it. And it just, pardon the pun, it sort of grew like a weed in many ways in terms of all over the country. It was almost too much. The DEA would have had to stop all enforcement against cocaine, meth, heroin, prescription drugs to even make a mark on what was happening because medical marijuana was popping up everywhere. And so it's sort of like they were able to outlast them because there was a big response uh, at a time and then they've kind of gone from there does that That's answer your question well yeah can I, can I just sorry to hog the mic Sagar, yeah. but just a quick follow up on this 
I'm realizing I sound sort of like an idiot because obviously meth yeah. is way worse than marijuana. Yeah, I know. It <laughs> you know so, so obviously, yeah. part, it's not just that you couldn't get away with saying medical meth because if there was medical meth, there would be a disaster. Actually, yeah. if, if people were consuming meth at with all of the flaws in the system that you describe with medical with marijuana, we would actually have a national emergency on our hands. We had a, we had a national emergency in states like Oregon during the 2000s. But Sagar, I'll throw to you. But I just have to make that comment. Well, I don't think we're that yeah. far off from having medical all drugs and then the legalization of all drugs. Oh. It sounds crazy, but it's going to happen anyway. Sagar, sorry. I actually I agree with you, Kevin, on and I want to save that really for the end because it's an mm-hmm. important lead up to this discussion mm-hmm. and part of why I think understanding the actual history of this stuff yeah. is very important. So we have medical marijuana and, I, and you know i'm like 28 so i like vaguely okay. remember this being like oh wow they have like guys who go yeah. around being like hey I, you know some doctor will write me a script and i can just yeah. go buy pot at this store but yeah. i feel like it went from that to like drugs are legal so yeah. quickly yeah. how did that happen from a federal perspective advocate perspective what did they do and i guess it culminates in cal in colorado mm-hmm. in which they officially is it legal legalize yeah. marijuana how yeah. did that happen? How did we go from 2008, yeah. which is nobody's talking about legalization of marijuana, to what is it, 2014, 12, 12, yeah. 12, 12, pot's legal. What happened? Well, first of all, it was all part of a plan. Again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this was like drawn out. And, and I talk about mm-hmm. some of that in my book. I was able to obtain some of the internal discussions and papers where, they, where the pollsters, very famous pollsters, were saying, wait a minute. 80% of people hate the drug war, but only 20% want to legalize. So half of it, mission accomplished, but we got to get to the other half. How do we do that? We have to kind of do these things like medical marijuana, things like that. And and that strategy worked. And from a psychological point of view, um, that's also fascinating, not just legal. It's called a permission structure, right? You give someone the permission to be okay with something that they are not okay with before. And they did it by saying medical, and it's good for you, and it's not that bad. So all of a sudden you had this rise in medical marijuana in the 2000s. And then you had this industry around it, right? You had an industry that was operating state legally, federally, illegally, very shady, but they started to amass a lot of money and started funding advocates. So now the advocates didn't have to rely on the billionaires anymore, who were very eccentric people actually doing a lot of different things. They didn't have to rely on that. They could rely on more of the industry that was making money illegally from medical funding some of this advocacy and funding, you know, just uh, different campaigns to change people's minds. Mm. Uh, And then you were able to say, well, if the feds, you know, they didn't shut down medical marijuana in Colorado or whatever. So I think we should, you know, let's, let's keep pushing the envelope and see what's going to happen. See, let me, let's dare them to do something on this. And God forbid, if they do, we'll bring out a kid with seizures and say he needs CBD, which by the way, I'm fully in favor of kids with seizures getting, you know, proper, pure, Mm -hmm. you know, FDA approved CBD oil. So don't, I don't want to hear people saying like, oh my God, my kid, this isn't about your kid. They're using your kid. They've used your kid and they're using your kid for a much broader agenda. And so that's how this happened. And I'm not proud to say, and I talk about my struggle with it in the book, I think a key moment for this industry was in 2009, when basically Eric Holder was asked a question. This is how this weird stuff happens in Washington, right? Mm -hmm. Often it's like by accident. People think the government's so coordinated on the inside. They're not, okay? This is, most of these things can happen by accident. So Eric Holder is at a press conference where he's talking about something totally different. And then you had some, yeah, the attorney general at the time, right? right? 2009, Obama's attorney general. And then he's asked something about marijuana and he basically says medical marijuana. He And he says, I'll get back to you on that with something. We're, we're coming up with something. I don't know. I'll, I'll get back. So now he was on the hook to get back to people on something. Okay, That wasn't going to be forgotten. And so the Justice Department came up with this memo. It's the infamous, it's called, was called the Ogden Memo. And it was after the David Ogden, who was the Deputy Attorney General at the time. And I was at ONDCP, and I remember seeing it, my boss and I and others seeing it and saying, you know, all it says is if you're, a sick patient, if you're actually sick, the feds are not going to arrest you. Which, by the way, do you know how many sick patients the Bush administration arrested? Zero. Okay. So Mm -hmm. this wasn't a change in policy, right? This was just kind of putting on paper what was already happening. Because again, resource-wise, this wasn't going to never a priority. So this was put on paper and it said very clearly though, if you are selling, if you are a cartel, if you're this or you're that, we, you know, schedule one, marijuana is dangerous. I mean, it still had that rhetoric in there. 
And that memo was released and it changed the conversation overnight. I thought it would be ignored. What's the big deal? But I underestimated the advocates and they're very good. You know, people are like, well, they're just stoners. No, they're not. They're, they're very smart and very good. Okay. They don't forget things like you might expect. And they, they took this memo and they said, ah, this is the green light, the Obama administration, the new that everybody loves, Uh, 80% of America loved. Look at the new, look what they did. And I'm saying, yeah, it, they, it's the same, by the way, as the Bush. What are you talking about? And they're like, no. And then the media ran with it. And I will say, and I'm not one to like bash the media. I'm not here to say that. But it's just, I, I don't know. It's been difficult because frankly, a lot of people writing about stories, they're in the industry or they were in the industry or they're going to be in the industry. They're admitting to be regular users. I mean, it's, so you have all of this happening and you have all of this movement. And now all of a sudden it looked like there was a huge change in policy that increased the institutional investment in this just in a huge way, it exploded it. it. And that unfortunately was, was a, I think a turning point. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I have to do a bit of audience advocacy because I feel Sagar and I have made a slight mistake as we're conducting the conversation, which is we've made it what 30 minutes. And there are people in the audience who are pulling their hair out saying, guys, you haven't answered the basic question of why does this matter? Mm. This is a plant. Like we've literally gotten this comment. Good. It's a plant. I want to smoke it. Um, there yeah. was a good roundup that we'll link to a sure. re- review of your book, Philip Smith at Stop the Drug War. And his and on the Wikipedia that they have for you, the actual like core claim he's making, I think this is really well stated, whether you agree or not, is sure. he says you're willing to use the coercive power of the state to make us conform to your vision of public health. So let's just answer the question, Kevin. Why is weed bad in the sure. year 2021? Yeah, well, um, or, it is but, a plant. Wait, can I rephrase? Sure. Why is weed something that we need to have an intense Care debate about. around sure. coer- uh, you know, criminalization, that type sure. of stuff? Sure. Well, to premise it, um, I agree cannabis is a plant. Um, so is poison ivy. Uh, so is hemlock. And there are a lot of, pl- I don't care if it's a plant or not. And, and that, you know, that doesn't make something good or bad or whatever, but there are a lot of plants we do not want to consume that are bad for you from, it's not about political. It's a scientifically objective, objectively mm-hmm. that, that, that are not good for you to be in contact with. Okay. What about marijuana though? Well, the reason why I think we should care about it is first of all, unless you've used it in the last six months to a year and you've seen the products, you don't know what marijuana is. I'm just telling you, you do not know what it is because it is not what you used in college. It is not, it's not a joint anymore. That is not what my, actually my main concern. My main concern is that the commercialization of marijuana brought on by legalization has turned a plant with maybe low level THC 30 years ago, which is what gets you high into something much more radioactive, 90% THC waxes, the edibles, the oils, the sodas, the dabs. Why does that matter? Because don't take my word for it. As I tell every, you know, 16 year old who likes to challenge me at a, you know, wherever I am talking about this, (laughs) don't take my word for it. Don't listen to me. Also don't take, you know, stop the drug wars word for it either. Or, you know, pot is great for America Inc either. Take the word from the peer-reviewed journals, from the National Academy of Medicine, from from the CDC. And I know people hate institutions now that are, you know, everyone has an issue with CDC now, WHO. That's a whole other discussion. But look at multiple different institutions that we rely on for health advice and health issues that you're listening to, like the CDC or the NIH. And look at what they're saying about marijuana. They're saying this is not old marijuana. This is much more harmful. They're saying it is causally related to certain aspects of mental illness, not just correlated. They're saying it is absolutely related to IQ loss and cognitive disrepair. They're saying that it leads to car crashes, second biggest after alcohol because of the impairment. They're saying that if you're using, you're much more likely, even when you control for other factors, to be dependent on the state, to not graduate, to do poorly on entrance exams, to be late for work, to cost your employer, on and on and on. So my whole thing about it is, I think public policy, and this gets to your question, I think, Marshall, I think public policy 
should be in the business of discouraging this activity. That doesn't mean I want people in prison. Let me be very clear. Mm -hmm. I don't want people arrested and in prison for using marijuana. And that may shock some people. I've been very clear about that forever. That's not a new position. I don't think your life should be ruined by a criminal record. But if you're going 85 miles per hour on the, on the freeway and it's 55 or 65 or 70, you there, we want to discourage you going 85. We don't want to put you in prison necessarily. We don't want to, but we want to discourage you. And so people will say, but so many people use, and so the law is a joke. Well, a lot of people speed too. We still need to have speed limits because we're trying to encourage good behavior and discourage unhealthy and unsafe behavior. With marijuana, it's the same. I, I'm not some you know, outlier in the science. In fact, if you don't believe in the things I just said, you're an outlier in the science. The science is actually becoming very clear about where, and it's, it's, it's why the American Medical Association, every single major medical group in this country agrees with the things that I'm saying. It's not controversial in those, in those quarters, even if it is on like a Reddit sub thread or whatever, right. um, the, you know, because people translate Our comment their own section. <laughs> or your comment section, because people say, well, I once drove 75 and I'm fine. And so that, that's a stupid thing to have a speed limit. We would never say that because we realize mm. that you may do something that's dangerous and be fine. But when you look at the aggregate, there's a reason why the speed limit is 55 or 65 and not 90. Because It's not because there's plenty of people who can get away with it. They can. But it's because when you go 90, you're increasing the risk of something bad happening. And we want to discourage that. Again, not by, you know, putting you in the electric chair for speeding or giving, you know, or giving you a major thing on your record that you're never going to be able to erase, but we want to discourage this from happening. And I think that makes sense. I mean, you know we're funny, talking Kevin. about, you yeah, know, what go I just got to say, we're saying on the one hand, for example, there's a big debate raging about menthol flavored cigarettes, because mm -hmm. that's the only flavor that is still legal. Why? Because of the big tobacco industry. And they are trying to target, as they always have, these industries target the disenfranchised among us. They target the people that if they become addicted, they have a much harder time getting out of it. And that's on purpose because these industries rely on heavy use. And that's a key point. They rely on addiction for profit. But what are we talking about with menthol? What's the universal public health response? The universal among civil rights organizations, not just campaign for tobacco-free kids. I mean, among social justice groups, what do they want to do with menthol? Do they want to regulate it? No, they want to ban it. Why? Because when you ban something, yes, some people will still find a way to use it, no doubt. But when you ban something, fewer people use it. It is, it is discouraged in society. So you can't say you want to ban menthol, but then you're okay with you know, you somehow want to legalize marijuana, but maybe discourage it among kids and kind of have it. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Sorry. I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. It's important because whenever we're talking about ban is decriminalization yeah. versus legalization. Yeah. It's important for people to understand that decriminalization and legalization and it's uh could yeah. in, in could send the signal that something should be encouraged and is okay. Yeah. And we'll get to the whole alcohol question next yeah, because sure. that's important. But <laughs> yeah. I do want to say this, which is it's fascinating to me. Uh, I've been talking about this issue for a long time. Uh, and it used to be, I would say the same thing, CDC, NIH. These are all such political institutions, especially right now. I yes. mean, I disagree with a lot of CDC guidance. Yeah, uh, I, know. I have a lot of problems with the NIH. Yeah. Um, so do a lot of people. And WHO, yeah. And the, oh, the WHO, I mean, don't even bring that in here, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's like my first thing yeah. you're talking about. So my question is, is that, you know, if you look back at it, and I think the most high profile that the quote unquote anti pot or at least pot skeptic movement has been in the last couple of years was Alex Berenson. Um, he's also, at the same time, like yeah. one of the biggest COVID, I would, I don't know, yeah. you could say whatever you'd want about him. And I'm curious about fellow travelers within the movement within that context because from my perspective i think berenson's kind of quote unquote turn against the covid establishment not that he hasn't been right about some stuff or not has actually done tremendous damage um to anybody who is pot skeptical and you don't have to comment necessarily on him but i'm more just curious about your reaction um to the space with him malcolm gladwell and yeah. others in the 2021 moment that we are in today well, I was worried that I was going to get a question about Alex Berenson, and I was hoping it'd be like a week or two after the book. But now it's like the yeah. day before. That's a bad Gotta sign. Ask. It means I'm going to be asked. Means I'm going to yeah. be asked constantly, which I'm trying to avoid, right. Zagar. So thank you right. for that. 
Um, look, I, I, I don't agree with a lot of what Alex is saying about COVID. I, I, but I, you know, I, I'm not here to have the discussion on COVID. Yes. Um, you know, I think his book was very valuable. I think it opened up to a lot of people, uh, something that they weren't open to hearing because it was from a former New York times reporter, et cetera. Um, we're different people. We're different. Um, we have different postures on Twitter. Uh, we have different kind of the way we react to folks and that's okay. That's a yes. personality difference or whatever. And that's fine. He can do whatever he wants. Um, but you know, what's interesting to me on that question, Sagar is, are the people who agree with me who either don't speak up because they're afraid and there are many of them or don't speak up because it's like the 15th thing they do. It's not some, it's like the head of the APA and AMA, the incredible people in the scientific establishment agree with me. They would be in the anti-plot yes. space, but this is like not on the priority because they're, they're dealing with many other things right now. And frankly, I don't blame them. I sort of, people are like, well, why do you think this is such a big deal? Why have you devoted your life to this, Kevin? Because this isn't that big of a deal. And I'm like, because I'm kind of the only one who's willing to do it. And so, mm. or at least do it in a way that, you know, is raising money and is having an ascent. There are a lot of volunteers and great people out there that are doing stuff, but you know, someone who's like kind of, this is, this is what I'm doing right now. And, and it raising money for Patrick Kennedy, obviously is someone else. And he wrote the forward to the book uh, who, you know, is very much, uh, you know, in this discussion, David from, but again, even for David, who, who co-founded the group that I'm the head of, this is like something he thinks about now, maybe five minutes a year. And that's yeah. when I call him on the phone. And so, you know, th this is not necessarily the highest priority and I don't blame them. Like there's other, David, David has had very important other things to do. I'm not, you know, saying that he should have been doing that. Um, so I think that's part of it. Also organizations like AAA or, you know, safety organizations who, who are emailing us constantly and wanting to be in the know and wanting to be involved. And they kind of are, but again, this isn't the only thing they do. Whereas for with yes. Sam and with the work I'm doing now, this is the only thing we do. That makes Does sense. that make sense? Yeah, yes. I, I want to highlight a term that I literally took notes on once I heard it in the audible version of your book, which is the commercialization yeah. of the marijuana industry. Because I've always been, I'd say I'm light pro regulation. I mean, sorry, light pro legalization. It's like you said. You actually have this quick anecdote time. You had a funny articulation of President Obama just saying, hey, look, I get it, young yeah. people, but like yeah. on the list of yeah. issues, you yeah. always want to talk about it, but marijuana is like 14 and 15 yeah. relative to world peace and financial yes. reform, all these different things. So I'm a that's my perspective. But the thing that was the most eye-opening to me it wasn't the it wasn't the debate about mental illness. It wasn't those yeah. it was really just like, wait a second. What does it look like when this industry turns into a multi-billion dollar industry that has an incentive because these are companies that have to make money and have investors and in many ways are taking venture capital. So it's not just like a small business here, right? You need no. to get a 10x return on what you're doing to make this yeah. work because we've seen this happen before. We saw this yeah. with the tobacco industry. In the 50s, but it's really funny. We spend our time saying, ha ha, it's crazy. They had, you know, and you cite this, you know, Fred Flintstone hawking cigarettes and they had the doctor <laughs> saying, oh, it smokes <laughs> good and makes you feel good. But now we have the same exact situation, but because it's vibey and it's weed, we don't think about it. And so much of our image of this industry is camouflaged by my image of my friends back in middle school who are just like, once again, rolling joints and just smoking Whatever. a bit, yeah. which is different than a multi-billion dollar industry. So can you just speak to yes. this? Because I think this is the most moderate thing that basically yeah. everyone should be able to get on board. Absolutely. I mean, again, I can look at the lens of history. You know, tobacco has been around for thousands and thousands of years. When did it start killing people? Not until the beginning of the last century. Okay. Wow. Why? What happened then? Well, there was an industry that started. What did they do? They took the tobacco plant, they put nicotine in it, and they did a lot of other things to it. And the most important thing they did from their perspective was they created this funny little thing called a cigarette and they mass produced it, meaning you could inhale and take in so much more tobacco and now nicotine and tar and other things that you never could have done before. What did that do? That created the biggest public health pandemic of our existence, killing 420,000 Americans a year still. It's the number one cause of preventable death in the world. I mean, we could go on and on and on about tobacco, but that wasn't deadly until business got involved. I actually see marijuana in a very similar light. You know, we used to talk about 4% THC, 5% THC joints, 
because of this industry, not because of Pablo Escobar, and I don't like Pablo Escobar, trust me, drug dealers are bad, bad guys, and we need to get them. And I'm not, I'm not saying we, we like them. Okay. But Pablo Escobar did not invent the 99% THC dab that is yeah. sending. Now we know over 700,000 people a year to the emergency room. That is the number one reason why kids are in treatment for drugs today. Th that wasn't invented by a mean drug dealer who, you know, our image of drugs is like a, usually someone of color predator, being a predator around a neighborhood and opening up their trench coat saying, Hey kids, you know, pick one of your mm. drug. What do you want to, uh, and, but in reality, the biggest drug dealer has been this industry and this has been commercialized. And so that is my worry is that by legalizing, we're not, look, if we were Sweden or, you know, like Finland or something. And we're like, we're going to legalize it, but we're going to have a limit on the THC. And then we're going to only sell it in three state sponsored stores. We're going to have advertisements about why it's not good for you. We're going to ban commercials. We're going to ban, you know, mascots. We're not going to have celebrity endorsements. Like if we were a controlling society like that, and we could pull that off, I might be, you know, talking about the injustice of, you know, parking meter policy instead or something like it just might be something that I be, would be maybe even less interested in. But we're not. We're the U.S. of A. We are the home of Madison Avenue. We market the heck out of things. We know how to sell and we know how to commercialize something. And so my worry is that especially ironically, at the same time as we've tried to shut out big tobacco that we are rolling out the red carpet for this industry, which by the way, is totally invested in by big tobacco and big alcohol. So that's like, that not only is it an analogy, they're actually becoming the same industry in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about what I call addiction for profit. What does that mean? It means you only make money in an addictive industry among the people that use your product the most. And that's usually not even more than 20% of your total customer base. 20% uses 80% of the product. That's the same with alcohol. Yes. That's Pareto's rule, right? If you know public policy, that's Pareto's mm -hmm. rule. And that is what it is with this industry. This industry is not interested in adults using a joint, like my parents' generation, smoking a joint, you know, once a year or once a month or something on a special occasion. That's not what makes them money. What makes them money is people starting the younger that they can and using in the most dangerous way. In other words, heavy use. We've had a almost an order of magnitude increase in the number in the amount of hours of heavy users in this country, especially among young people over the last 30 years. I mean, the level is just not comparable at all. And that is the industry's objective is as much as possible, as often as possible, we need lifelong customers. And they're taking their, their playbook from big tobacco. I just want to pull out one quick thing because it sent me rushing to Google to Google the stat you're referencing. And I know people are going to be wondering about this. 700,000 people. Yeah to an emergency yeah. room every year. What could you just, cause that seems crazy to me, it right? I was seems, like, was he misciting that? Yeah. When I have gov like literally the second thing that comes up is like, obviously oh, yeah, this is your is. job, yeah. you know your stats, <laughs> yeah. but there's a government, these are, these are actual statistics. Um, so yeah, can you these, explain it? Yeah, these are real statistics. So, so usually we get our emergency room ad admissions data from a source called the Drug Abuse Warning Network, DAWN. DAWN was discontinued in 2011 um, for budget reasons. It's actually coming back now, but um, which is too bad that it was discontinued. But when it was discontinued at the time in 2011, when the number of users was way lower, at the time, DAWN cited about 400,000 admissions, 420. But luckily, there was another data set uh, out Sorry, there wait, called- I hate to interrupt. Just one quick. Sure. What do you mean by admission? What is happening? Okay, I'll tell you like, what that like, means. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. So what it means is that someone, usually it means you had a panic attack or some kind of psychotic break. I mean, it, it, it happens a lot. And it's so bad that you yourself or somebody takes you to the emergency room to calm you down to something's happening with you. You don't, they can't deal with it. I mean, imagine how many that they don't take to the emergency room, but mm. this is only the ones we know of. They take you to the emergency room and it's usually some kind of panic attack, psychotic break. Um, most of the time it's like a maybe one or two day stay and then you're gone. So I'm not saying that you're in there forever and you're dying and you're intubated. I'm not making those claims, but the point is you are using healthcare resources and you are going to the emergency room because of, because mm -hmm. of marijuana. Well, you freaked out enough to go to an emergency room. Usually it's I to freak out. Yeah, the, yeah. And the doctor has said that. And so I'll just to close the loop, cause I know there'll be people Googling this stat. So Don left 
or not Don left, Don was discontinued. And then there was another one called NEDS, which is the National Emergency Database System, something like that. And in 2011 for that one, you can compare it to Don, it was 646,000. So Don was an underestimate, 646, but that was 10 years ago at a time when the level of marijuana use was so much lower than now. So I'm comfortable rounding 646 to seven and saying it's at least 700,000 admissions. See, and this is another important point, which is that we don't really have a lot of data on this. And there are yeah. a lot of self-interested actors in a lot of different states, which don't yeah. necessarily want you to have the data. But mm. I want to get to something that you said, which I think is very important. You said, well, if we lived in Sweden, if we lived so-and-so, maybe, yeah. but this is America. Yeah. So Kevin, is it just that you don't have faith that us as Americans can figure it out? Because, and I'm kind playing of. somebody else, um, <laughs> I live in DC. When I go to yeah. Virginia, it's a pain in the ass. But if I want to go buy alcohol, I have to go to the ABC store. Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend's from Pennsylvania. When I go to Pennsylvania and I want to buy some booze, like I have to go to the yeah. state control place. But like here in DC, it's a free for all. Or yeah. like if you're in Nevada, you can buy right. booze at like a gas station, which yes. I think is crazy. Um, so if I'm saying like, if you're going to put it in that context, why is it impossible to mm -hmm. create the regulatory regime you're talking about here in the United States? Because yeah. anybody who is advocating for that would be like, Kevin, that sounds totally reasonable, dude. Why can't we do that here in the U.S.? You're saying it's practically impossible. The, there's I'm saying it's question. politically and practically impossible. It's A, it's politically impossible because the industry has full reins and they are not going to relinquish this. And they are they are controlling. And I talk about it in the book. And there's so much corruption around the marijuana industry in terms of paying off politicians. I mean, look at any politician advocating for pot and please look about where they get their money from. I mean, it's very, very clear the, 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 tra the trajectory. So I think it's politically impossible. I also don't think we do alcohol particularly well. I mean, we shouldn't be that proud of the way we regulate alcohol it kills 100,000 people a year. It's the number one cause of arrest. You know, people say we need to not arrest. We need to treat marijuana like alcohol so that we arrest fewer people. Do folks realize that we have twice as many alcohol related arrests in this country than marijuana related arrests? So there are more people in prison and in the criminal justice system because of booze than marijuana. So we don't do that that, that well. There's still rules around alcohol that are routinely broken and there's still disproportionate policing that happens all the time. And it's, and it's directed at alcohol. So this idea that somehow by legalizing marijuana, we're going to fix that, I think is, 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 is wrong. So I don't think we even handle alcohol that well. You know, we haven't raised the federal excise tax on alcohol. I mean, we have the same, if you adjust for inflation versus the Korean War, our taxes for alcohol are, were five times greater during the Korean War than they are now adjusting for inflation. That's because of lobbyists. So I just don't have faith that in our current political legal system with lobbyists and with industry reigning supreme, that we are gonna be able to do this well at all. And from a practical perspective, um, you know, 50 states, 50 different regimes, the idea that you're gonna have all 50 conform to some public health norm uh, is, is not gonna happen. You know what's fascinating? I'm just realizing that something we talk a lot about, Kevin, is the fact that libertarians are finding themselves yeah. increasingly homeless politically in this country. But this seems to be an area where libertarian arguments, small yes. L, yep. are just completely winning out. Because this is an example of a space yep. where every single time I try to think of pushback to what you're saying, it's, hey man, it's America. Mm -hmm. It's freedom. You know what? It's true that people go to the hospital and it does mean that technically yeah. speaking, my health insurance is higher because of the existence of of alcohol but i just don't really care sure. that's just not yeah. that, that's that's a very and that's not the argument you're making but whenever people yeah. try to make that argument of oh you should be in favor of x because now it costs you more money we should ban sugary soda because your health care but like people just don't care it's not a very quote-unquote american yeah. argument so can yeah. you speak to the role that our broader political culture has when it comes Big to this time. specific issue Absolutely. Well, I think the, the sort of the rise of libertarianism in the early 2000s and mid 2000s and 2010s, it, it's not just a coincidence that marijuana legalization became more popular. So I think that, the, 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 you know, and distrust of institutions is that's not not a not a coincidence either. All of these came kind of together, the perfect storm, along with, you know, it's not it, it, it helps to have three billionaires, too, I have to say, because there's a lot of libertarian ideas that never would get you know, the time of day if it didn't have the money behind it. So it, that helped as well. Um, but but I think the, the 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 part that when I talk to my libertarian friends and I've converted a few of them, usually the best argument to, to, that I use is 
look at the dependency on the state you are creating when you allow this to happen. It doesn't mean that I want a police state that, that polices everybody's behavior, but it means that if you are in the business as a government of encouraging this behavior, you are encouraging a behavior that for a lot of people means they are and this is just according to the statistics, they're going to be more likely to be on social assistance. They're going to be more likely to need drug treatment. They're going to be more likely to need some kind of other state assistance of healthcare or some other kind, housing, et cetera. And so, you know, that doesn't really help. And I'm not talking about an adult's, I don't care if an adult smokes a joint in the privacy of their own home. This is not even about that at all. This is not about Kevin judging somebody who's using because they're a bad person and I'm making a moral argument. No, this is about the fact that we are underestimating how today's high potent marijuana actually practically affects many sectors of society today. And from a more global point of view, which we have not talked about, how does this affect the global readiness of America? America and American workers and American students and young people, because I will tell you of the rising countries in this small world of ours, um, in, the, in the ones that are rising economically, they're not contemplating legalizing marijuana. In fact, they are fighting any effort to legalize marijuana because they don't want their people to be on marijuana. So I, I think there are a lot of things we need to, and by the way, that was Jerry Brown, Moonbeam Jerry Brown. That oh, was God. his top argument against the legalization of marijuana when it came up in California, because he was against it. He said, I don't want to basically give China something on a silver platter. And I think there's some interesting points to that. So we're nearing the end here, Kevin. And the obvious question is like, okay, well, what do you want? And so first, though, I do think it's important. Lay out the various, like in, in as short as you can, what is the actual regulatory framework of marijuana in America? Because I can't even keep up. <laughs> Apparently it's legal somewhere else. Yeah. It's like, from what I hear, you have to hear around here, you have to go buy a gift and then somebody yeah, you gives do. you like- We sound so pot, uncool, some pot. it's not even funny. Yeah, I'm, I'm a narc, hear. get it. From what <laughs> I hear, um, from what I've observed. Yeah. Um, but also everybody's, anyway, so it's decriminalized, I believe here in DC, uh, legal-ish in some places in this country, a very legal in Colorado, Nevada, yeah. maybe California. Um, so what is the current state of yeah. marijuana's regulatory framework? And then what do you propose yeah. as the overarching federal system that yeah. we should institute given all so, of your concerns? So our federal law is the same. Marijuana is illegal for any use, for any purpose, including medical, unless it's FDA authorized. That's the federal. That's, that's pretty easy. Uh, from a state perspective, there's 16 states in D.C. that technically have legalization on the books, but they they treat marijuana differently within that. So in D.C., you can't have stores um, because Congress has has barred them from having stores, but you can sell a T-shirt for two hundred dollars and somehow give a free give free marijuana with that two hundred dollar T-shirt. So that's quasi legal, quasi legal in Washington D.C. Um, in California, Colorado, and most of the other states, it's sold in stores that basically have very little regulation. And in the book, I talk to these whistleblowers uh, who tell me that there's basically no regulation, that the lab numbers are cooked. You don't know what's in your stuff. There's a myth of regulation that, well, at least you'll know what's in your marijuana. No, you don't. It's totally, everything's mislabeled. The numbers are wrong. There's, 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 there's politics behind the numbers, but that's technically in 16 states. Um, and then in about 30 some states, I can't keep track, you have some sort of medical exception, like a medical marijuana law. Uh, so it's all over the place. And look, I don't think that's a tenable situation. I, I, I you know, I think that that, if I anything, yeah. in, in some ways it, it better, you know, I always, you know, I'm, I'm very much against federal legalization. I do not think that's a good idea. However, part of me, and again, I don't really talk about this openly that much, but he, here I am now. Um, part of me wants to tell my friends quote unquote friends in the marijuana industry, be careful what you wished for. You kind of have a good thing going right now. If you want this regulated on the federal level and you want the FDA involved uh, and you want all of these, you know, you may not be, unless you're a big fish, you may not be prosperous in a, in a world where marijuana is legal federally. Um, I think in a world where marijuana is legal federally, though, you do have these big fish that are prosperous. And that is what worries me is you have big tobacco and big alcohol fully taking over. They've already partly taken over, fully taking over. And I don't think that's good for public health. What I would like to see is a truly like science based. OK, we're not saying you're going to, you know, 
use heroin tomorrow if you smoke a joint. But let's what does THC do to you? Like you like let's get the facts out there just so it's clear about what the risks are. Um, so I'd like to see some more prevention and awareness uh, on this. Um, I think it should be legal, but I would treat it a little bit more like a traffic ticket, a little bit, you know, in terms of personal possession, I would not be doing formal arrests that stay on people's records. I think a lot of people who use a lot of marijuana that are caught by law enforcement, they have a marijuana problem. You know, denial is the hallmark of addiction and uh, we, marijuana addiction is real. There was just a study by NIH showing that marijuana addiction was twice as prevalent than alcohol or cigarettes among young people who you who have used in the last year. That's a huge stat because we think of cigarettes and alcohol having addiction levels that are much higher. But this study actually says no, because of today's high potency marijuana, that's not the case. So so we need to get more people to help actually. It means get more people into treatment. Again, if you're an adult smoking a joint, no, I don't think we should use police resources there. So mm-hmm. as we're finishing up here, I know people hate predictions so i'm not going to phrase this as i guess i just did this isn't a prediction question kevin this is a respond to a scenario question here's the scenario as we're looking back at the history that you told us sometimes marijuana is on the rise sometimes on it's on the fall if you look at the world of 1976 the way you were describing that seems to be a world where you're going to get drugs decriminalized in the next the next the second term of jimmy carter yeah. Doesn't happen. So given everything we're describing, given the fact that if you are correct, let's say if you are 60% correct, there will be some backlash to the status quo. If you are, if yeah. 60% of what you're saying here today is correct, yeah. a marijuana industry that perpetuates the harms you're describing will not be received well in the next 10 years. That's the, I think the really smart point you're making with your be careful what you wish for thing. Yeah. Can you just articulate how you could see this playing out in different ways? Like, how could the narrative shift or go in some different directions? Well, uh, look, I'll never underestimate the ability of of these massive corporations for driving, being able to drive public opinion for a long time. So I don't have a time frame. I don't know if it's going to be 10 years. I mean, it could be tomorrow if we had a major plane crash, which I don't want to have. I'm not saying we want that, but it could be, you know, next week if a high level official is involved in a marijuana related train uh, accident crash or something like that, that could switch, you know, like Len Bias's death in many ways switched this because cocaine, you know, used to be seen as a Wall Street drug that was relatively harmless in the late 1970s. And then that just changed for a lot of reasons. So you could have a, a, a switch that happens quickly. I, because of the nature of marijuana, I often talk about marijuana as sort of a slow kill drug. It's not something that overnight you necessarily see a massive change in someone unless they're using very, very high potent very often. But what I see is maybe in the next couple of decades, actually, uh, maybe sooner, I don't know, a, a shift, the way we see, the way we saw smoking shift, right? We said like, you know, we ne- we always thought we'd have smoking sections in restaurants or in airplanes. Mm-hmm. You know, how could we not? We had so many smokers. You mean you mean the airline industry is going to give that up? That's never going to happen. That that's what was said thirty years ago. Um, I, so I don't. I, I think we are going to have that backlash. Um, people, you know, even even hipsters in Brooklyn, especially the ones with new kids, you know, that new parents, they don't want to smell pot everywhere they go, as they are now. Uh, they don't necessarily want it in their face in a way that we're seeing more and more. So I do think there will be a backlash. Uh, I, I just don't know how long it's going to take. Um, you know, we'll see. But yeah, predictions in this business are, you know, the pot industry has been predicted marijuana is going to be legal every year for the last 20 years. Um, you know, a good friend of mine who who passed away, an a- academic who I often sparred with, said that marijuana, he, he said with certainty. This is, this Mark, is this Mark Kleiman? Mark Kleiman, yeah, good, good, that I've known forever. Mark said, marijuana will be legal in Hillary Clinton's second term of office. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I think, I think 2016 taught us about predictions, but I'd say there probably will be a backlash. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. You know, in my mind, what you said, where wherever suburban white women go, um, that's where politics go. Um, in the 1980s, it was anti-pot. Right now, actually, as you point out in your book, some of the largest users of some of these THC products, yeah. if they start to see problems, then and look, let's be honest, I didn't, I don't think this is fair, by the way, but like you know, that's how politics yeah. works. They vote and they have a lot of money. If they start to to basically do a 1980s level backlash, then maybe perhaps things will change. I Kevin, think the teens, I wanna, when oh, the teens ahead. today, when the teens, sorry, when the teens yeah. today get older, that is going to be seeing, we're going to be seeing some of the backlash. I mean, my email inbox every day 
our, our parents with with you know kids having an issue and they they the parents themselves say i thought that was okay it wasn't heroin or opioids so i and i used mm-hmm. it in college i thought it was a rite of passage and now they're paying 500 grand you know for drug treatment and they're it's a mess i think that will happen yeah, I think that's fascinating. Marshall, do you have anything? That was my final No, I, I think that was... I, yeah. Actually, there's one last There's one last thing if we could get you, which is not in the right order, but psychedelics. Mm. What's up? What's going on? This is also well, think- a thing. Because once again, as we're talking about... Because once again, I love the way you, you set this up historically. It really seems like in so many ways, we're back in 1976. Marijuana is... If you go by our... If you go by our Twitter's... All of the cool, like I'm a tech bro, finance yeah. type who's living as a Tim nomad Ferris. in Wyoming. Yeah, loves yeah. Weed's lame. That's yesterday's news. Psychedelics, hallucinogenics, all of it. What's going on there? Well, they're following a very well done playbook by the marijuana industry of legalizing it for medical purposes and then mainstreaming it, getting billionaires and big names behind you. And they're doing a very good job of it. I actually... Uh, in a, on the Intelligence Square debate later this week, I will be debating um, Rick Doblin, who's kind of the head, the godfather of the current godfather of the movement. Is, he's a student of Timothy Leary. Him and a colleague are debating me and the chair of the Columbia University Psychiatry Department, a guy named Jeffrey Lieberman, very prominent mental health guy, um, about whether we should legalize this or not and the dangers about it. But I think it speaks to a broader issue, Marshall, which is that this is not about the legalization of marijuana. It's frankly not even just about the legalization of now the next chapter, psychedelics. It's really about the legalization and acceptance of all yeah. drugs. And we see that movement. We see some prominent authors now come out and talk about well, how regular heroin use is actually okay. Forget about marijuana. That just, that's like a white drug. You're, you're dealing with marijuana. No, I'm talking and psychedelics is a white drug. So let's talk about cocaine and crack and meth and, and heroin as being able to be used regularly and most people are fine. And the government's been lying to you your whole life about its harms. I think that's next. I think that's right around the corner. No, I think you're right. I think that Dr. Carl Hart, um, who was on my friend Joe Rogan's podcast, he absolutely did. It was like a break the glass, shatter the moment, said the quiet part out loud. And a lot of people are defending him for it. And it all comes down to, I guess, this question of incentivize or un- or not incentivize. So Look, we're all Americans here. We want people to be able to do whatever right. they want. But you're also a fool if you think that government policy, in many respects, does not incentivize or disincentivize people regardless of its intent. And right. so when having a discussion around discrete policy choices and the externalities, negative and positive, that will flow from that, it's really important. But the number one question, Kevin, that we have heard, and I have heard basically my entire life, is, and I have to ask it in the way that no, we're, no. But what about but what about alcohol? Mm, but what yeah. about alcohol? From that perspective, just get, and you talked about this a bit on Rising when you were on about a year, or maybe it was two years ago. Wow, yeah. it's been a long time. Um, what about alcohol, Kevin? Because we have like, and you've answered the regulatory environment around yeah. it, but. If it's legal and we have to deal with it, why should that not be the case for all drugs? Because I believe that that is where it stems from all the way up to the heroin ladder scale, as basically Dr. Carl Hart said on Joe Rogan's podcast. The majority of the reason why alcohol is dangerous and is a killer is because it is legal. (laughs) So let me, and that may sound provocative and I'm not, and I'm not saying we should go back to alcohol prohibition though. So that, and that's not contradictory. Let me tell you why. Why is alcohol legal? Is it because it's good for you and we think everyone should drink? Do do moms go around and say, if only my husband drank more and my son, we'd be better off as a family. Uh, cops don't go around and say, if only everybody drank more, boy, we'd be safer. No, alcohol is not legal because it's such a great thing for you to use. Alcohol is legal because it's been used by the majority of Western civilization since before the Old Testament. We're stuck with it. And we're not handling it particularly well, but we also know prohibiting it is futile because 80% of people want to do it on a regular basis. And they have been doing that for 5,000 years. Heroin, even marijuana. Okay, you can go from marijuana to the extreme of heroin. These are things that have been used historically. I'm not denying their historical place in certain civilizations but they have not been used by the majority of Western inhabitants or any inhabitants for thousands and thousands of years, meaning we're not yet stuck with it as a mainstream part of the human condition. And 
so that's the difference. And by the way, why would we want it to be mainstream? Again, alcohol, all the problems it brings, it's not something that we want to replicate. And I don't get why people think we would want to ever replicate that. And finally, on, on what you're talking about with Carl, um, again, plenty of people drive 100 miles an hour sometimes on the freeway. That's not a reason to say that that's a good thing. Yeah, I think it's very important and very well said. Um, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of hate mail for this one, but that's okay. I, I really enjoy it. talking with you, Kevin. <laughs> and if people want to hear a well-articulated, nuanced view on this issue, you can buy his book on our bookshop. Appreciate you joining us, sir. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah.